My name is Steve Schlesinger. I just retired from a very long and satisfying career teaching philosophy part-time. I taught at San Diego State University for 36 years, <clears throat> from 1980 to 2016. I taught at the Catholic University of San Diego <clears throat> from 31 years, from 1985 till just very recently. Uh, I survived uh, on a semester-to-semester -semester basis for all of that time just on the popularity of my classes because of my student evaluations. I didn't have a similarly great career as a graduate student at UCSD. I tried for 10 years, never got my PhD. I have no publications to teach for so long at major universities without a PhD is virtually impossible. Again, I did it just because my classes were so popular, made me a couple of million dollars over the years and provided me with a great retirement. Although not everybody loved my class, if you consult my review, some people hated me, although I hope eventually they changed their minds. I remember one of my department chairmen called me in and said, you know, Steve, not everybody loves you, like he didn't think I'd already learned that in my life. And all I could think was to say to him, you know, um, not everybody loved Jesus either. Look what they did to him after all. Why should I expect to do better than Jesus? And since I'm on that subject, that's really where I'm going to start with an explanation of what I like to call God's position. You will see these are not your usual Sunday school lectures, and this isn't a lecture on philosophers. One of my former students said to me, oh, I'm from Saudi Arabia, and Saudi Arabia philosophy classes aren't like this. It's the history of the philosophers. This isn't the history of the philosophers. I'm going to teach you what it is that these philosophers have taught me about what's going on in life and in the world in which we live. God's position. I hope God likes these lectures. And I was inspired to this one morning when I woke up and I turned to the flag in the corner of my bedroom to say the Pledge of Allegiance. I assume we all have a flag in the corner of our bedroom and say the Pledge of Allegiance every morning just because I'm not in school. It's no excuse to not pledge allegiance to the flag. And I heard myself saying, under God with liberty and justice for all. These lectures really are a commentary on what that should mean to God. And so, in the beginning, how else do you start a lecture on God, but in the beginning, we were created, creation stories all over the world in all times and places for reasons I will be explaining. Around here, of course, the most common one, we were created for happiness, Paradise, the Garden of Eden, nice young couple named Adam and Eve. But you know the story, along comes the snake, they eat the apple, they fall, and ever since then the most important thing in our life from the point of view of Judeo-Christian tradition, and I like to put this as I like to put things as often as I possibly can in terms of my favorite lyrics to my favorite songs, and this is not just one of my favorite songs but favored by many of you. You've sung it before in your life, you've all heard it. God is making a list and checking it twice. He wants to find out who has been naughty and who has been nice. We simply use Santa Claus as a substitute God figure teach the children the essence of the religion, Judeo-Christianity. If you are a nice child all year long in your stocking, you get presents. If you are a nice person all your life long, you get the cosmic present, bliss in heaven for all of eternity with God. If you are a naughty person all your life long, then you get the cosmic punishment. They send you to hell where they pile all those lumps of coal up around you and set the coal on fire and burn you in the coal fires of hell. Is that what the coal is supposed to stand for? Is that why it's in the stocking? I never wish you it seems like that would be appropriate. In other words, one day after you die, you are heading for God's holy judgment. Judgment Day, you've all heard of this. What's the name of that guy at the gate? Saint Peter at the gate. Heaven and hell in the background, whether you get bliss for all of eternity, whether you burn for all of eternity. Sounds pretty important, don't you think? And of course, you have to do what God wants you to do. I'll call that morality. Avoid doing what God doesn't want you to do. Let's call that immorality. 
element of reward and punishment in your next life, directly according to what you did in this life. And this thread also common to all the world's religions. There's a creator who's watching you, judging you. Creator has a different name. What's in a name? God, Jesus, Allah, Buddha, Shiva. Do what they want. Avoid doing what they don't want. Around here, if you do what they want, you get a big reward. You get heaven for all of eternity. For the Buddhist and Hindu, you do what you're supposed to do. You get a reward. In your next life, you're reincarnated as something better. Around here, in the Western religions, you do something bad. You're punished in your next life. You, traditionally, you go to hell. Uh, for the Buddhist and Hindu, you don't do what God wants you to do. You're punished in your next life. You're reincarnated as some lower form of life. And so, judgment of morality, and I'll try to explain what I think morality means when they ask Jesus what is the greatest commandment in the Christian religion. This is Matthew, I've got my Bible with me, Matthew chapter 22, verse 35, 36. What is the greatest commandment? Does that sound like it would be important? What is the greatest commandment? Jesus says, love God with all your heart and soul and might and mind. Although initially, perhaps I'll claim that I'm confused about this. I've never met God. Maybe. How am I supposed to love God if I've never met him? I mean, maybe I have met God. I want to leave all possibilities open, but maybe I've never met God. Lots of people in the world have still never heard of God. How are you supposed to love something that you've never even heard of? That wouldn't provide justice for all. And so, to be fair, to give justice for all, the Bible goes on to say that there is a second commandment that is like the first. That's what the Bible says. The second commandment is like the first. That's Matthew 22, verse 39. Second commandment is like the first. And here's a question for you logic students. If two things are alike, if they're really, really alike, then are they different? I once had a guy shaking his head, yeah, yeah, if two things are alike, they're different. I didn't know what to do with that. Go get yourself a dictionary, look up the definition of alike, look up the definition of different, you will see that to the extent that things are alike, they're not different. And to the extent that they're different, they are not alike. And to my knowledge, the Bible never says they are different. It only says they are alike. That second commandment, like the first, the famous golden rule of Christianity, and I will try to show of religion and people generally, that you love your neighbor as yourself, and you do unto others as you yourself would be done by. And so that makes it fair to everybody. All you have to do is love your neighbor as yourself. The Bible says that's the same as loving God. Although, of course, lots of people don't seem to think that they are the same. A lot of people think to love God, I've got to say, hey, God, man, I sure do love you. That doesn't seem to be exactly the same as loving your neighbor. And yet the Bible says they are the same. They are alike. And so that would be the definition of morality, who loves their neighbor as themselves. The opposite of that, immorality, says in the first book of Timothy, one of my favorite passages, the love of money is the root of all evil. Not money, by the way, just because you're born rich, just because you're rich doesn't mean you're evil. It's the love of money that's the root of all evil. And now I want to criticize this, and if I feel free to criticize the Bible, you can imagine what I did with my students' papers, but it doesn't seem to me to be right to say the love of money is the root of all evil. What about rape? That's evil. That's not done for money. What about child molesting? That's as evil as it comes. That's not done for money. They're not after the kid's money. The kid doesn't have any money. And if the love of money is the root of all evil, then I have a lot of trouble understanding why they get so upset premarital sex, sex outside of marriage. I mean, I understand with prostitution there's money involved, but I'm talking about the frisky frolickings that college alcohol and sex parties are so famous for. That doesn't have to do with money, does it? That's just love and hormones, usually mixed with lots of alcohol. But properly speaking, if you want to turn something into its opposite, morality into immorality, just put a not in front of the sentence, the opposite of loving your neighbor as yourself, not to love your neighbor as yourself, to love yourself more than your neighbor, to be selfish. Sin always has an I in the middle. I got that, by the way, from a 
Vietnamese Methodist Church, Wesleyan Methodist Church on the corner of Colwood and El Cajon Boulevard here in San Diego. I was stopped at the traffic light as I was going to the markets in City Heights. I looked up at the marquee of the church. It said, sin always has an eye in the middle. I knew it went in this lecture right here. I'm the center of everything. Everything revolves around me. Being selfish, that explains why rape and child molesting are evil. It's not that they're done for money, but they're selfish acts, just done for the pleasure of the perpetrator, not caring about the pain done to the victim. And maybe this is why premarital sex is wrong, because it's just a selfish act done for your own pleasure. Maybe at the moment of ecstasy the word love comes out of your lips, but really it's just done for your own selfish pleasure. You're just being selfish. Although with this one I like to point out out, provided we're dealing with consenting adults, of course, no one is being harmed. And so maybe that's what makes it a little bit different. And so who is loving, who is selfish, the true nature of your moral character, whatever exactly you think that means, but for it to count as the true nature of your moral character, you have to be free to show your true moral character. Here's the liberty part and why free will is not just the cherished American value land of the free. Freedom cherished and needed by the God who is supposed to be judging our moral character. You have to be free to show your true moral character. If, for example, you're a teller at a bank and I come into the bank with a sawed-off shotgun, put the shotgun in your face, reach into the cash drawer, reach out, give, reach in, give me all of your money, or I'll pull the trigger on this 12-gauge and blow your brains all over the back wall of the bank if you really thought that I would do that, then as soon as you could, before my finger slipped on the trigger and we had a horrible accident as far as your brains were concerned, you would reach into the cash drawer and give me the money. But then after I left the bank, would anyone come up and blame you? blame a word of negative moral assessment. Why did you give that person the bank's money? They didn't have a deposit, a withdrawal slip filled out. They didn't even have an account on deposit at this bank. Nobody would blame you. You didn't do it because you wanted to do it. You only did it because you were forced to do it. Somebody put a gun in your face and forced you. Similarly, if you're forced to do something good, we don't praise you. You come to my neighborhood. We have lots of homeless people, many of them veterans from our wars, suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, can't hold a regimented job in our society. We toss them out on the beach like they're trash. And I see you walking around and it looks to me like you have some extra money. So I come up to you with my stub nose 38 caliber, put it to your temple and say, see that poor homeless veteran over there? I want you to take out your money and take out $20 and give it to that poor homeless vet. If you don't, I'll pull the trigger and splatter your brains all over the sidewalk. If you really thought I would do that as fast as you could, you would reach into your pocket, take out your wallet, give the homeless vet $20. Nobody would praise you. Look at that kind, sweet, generous giving, loving person. They just took out $20 of their hard-earned cash, gave it to that homeless veteran. You didn't do it because you wanted to do it, didn't show anything about your true desires. Your true desire, of course, was to keep the 20 bucks and spend it on yourself and let the homeless vet worry about his own future. You only did it because you were forced to do it. Somebody put a gun to your head. What I'm really talking about, of course, is not your fellow human beings putting guns to your head, but the idea advanced by many people in this world that God points what I've always like to call metaphorically a cosmic hell gun at you, threatens to burn you in hell for all of eternity, even more intimidating than having an earthling shoot you, last for all of eternity, burning of course, is so extremely painful, if God let us know for sure. I'm here. I'm watching, these are the commandments, do them or you'll burn in hell, then the next time you thought of committing any sin, and I won't claim to know here exactly what a sin is, there are many different interpretations, I like to pick the common ones with which you are familiar, fornicating and shoplifting, I'll get to the shoplifters later, we'll start with the fornicators, it's fornication time, you're at one of college's famous alcohol and sex parties, you see somebody you think is a real hottie, they seem to think you also are a real hottie, Hottie, obviously they are very drunk. You're getting ready to go upstairs to an empty bedroom to have the very pleasurable act of sexual intercourse. You know what I mean by that, of course. If you really thought that's going to mean I'm going to burn in hell forever, then before you had the very pleasurable sexual intercourse with the hottie, my advice would be go downstairs, go into the kitchen, walk up to the stove, put the burner on high, put your hand on the stove, feel the pain burn into the palm of your hand, leave it there for a second or two, and then think 
think to yourself, if I commit this very pleasurable act of sexual intercourse with that real hottie, the heat I just felt on the palm of my hand will be not just on the palm of my hand, but will be all over my body. And it will last not just for a second or two, but will last me for all of eternity. If that doesn't convince you this is a really bad deal, this is a really bad trade, a relatively few moments of sexual pleasure, and no matter how much stamina you think you have to go at it for hours and hours or days and days, if you know your infinitesimal calculus compared to eternal burning, it's just an instant of pleasure compared to an eternity of pain. If that doesn't convince you, bad idea, bad trade, then my advice would be put both hands on the stove. Put your feet on the stove. Feel the pain burn into the soles of your feet like God will burn your immortal soul. Put over whatever part of your body on that stove you have to and leave it there and burn it. Because if there is a God who will send you to hell, you will be burned all over your body, even on your tender precious genitals, will last for all of eternity. Under those circumstances, of course you would obey. Doesn't show anything about your moral character. Doesn't show anything about your true desires. Your true desire was to have sex with the hottie, just like your true desire was to spend the 20 bucks on yourself. Your true desire is to have sex with the hottie. It's not what you really wanted to do, just what you were forced to do. And so to keep us free to show our true moral character, God can't uh, let us know any of this, that he exists, that there are commandments, that he threatens us with hell. Otherwise, of course, we would obey, but wouldn't show anything about our moral character, wouldn't show anything about our true desires, just shows what we are forced to do. There are many people, of course, who threaten you with hell. I'm I'm trying to show this must not come from a god who wants to judge your moral character and judge your true desires. Same thing, same logic with promises of heaven. If God let us know for sure, I'm here, I'm watching, these are the commandments, obey and you'll go to heaven, then of course we would do what God wanted us to do, but not so much freely, purely, just out of the goodness of our hearts, what Christians like to call agape, common Christian word, agape, real love, pure love, just being loving for the sake of being loving. There is an agape house at San Diego State University on many other campuses as well. I got this off a bulletin board, bonfire. I'm not sure if that's supposed to be a threat of hell. Meet at agape house. And also this one, barbecue and pool party at agape house. One student once asked if the barbecue was the metaphor for hell and the pool party was the metaphor for for heaven. Instead, it wouldn't be so much uh, real love. This, by the way, is Episcopal Methodist. I'm not really sure if they practice agape. I'll leave that to your judgment by the time that I'm done. If you're just doing it to go to heaven, that's not agape. That's what would be called eros. Love that wants something in return, expects something in return. Not real love, expectatious love. Generally speaking, of course, refers to sex, obvious common root with the word erotic, eros, erotic. I love you, but I gotta have sex with you, otherwise I'm not gonna love you so much. Maybe you're familiar with that attitude. Doesn't have to just mean wanting sex, can mean wanting anything. And so to illustrate this, I've always claimed to my students that really I am not just as listed in the schedule of classes, Steve Schlesinger, part-time philosophy teacher. Really my full name, and I don't even let them know, would be Steve Schlesinger Rockefeller. In case you haven't heard of the Rockefellers, we are among America's richest and most powerful families, 30 Rock, Rockefeller Center. And yet I say I don't want my friends to know this. I am afraid past experience confirms me it would ruin my social life. Anybody have any idea why? I wouldn't know so much who loved me for myself and who loved me for my money. As one of my students put it, I thought with unparalleled eloquence, guys with fat wallets tend to have lots of friends. Maybe you can imagine what my social life was like if I was at a college party and I would see a young lady that I thought was attractive. We would get the host to arrange an introduction. That's the way we did our hooking up when I was back in college. You get the host of the party to arrange a formal introduction introduction. It almost always went the same way. Not always, since I'm talking about my relationships and I'm a heterosexual. I want you ladies to know I am aware there are exceptions, but it almost always went the same way. Attractive young lady meet Mr. Steve Schlesinger Rockefeller and my, when they heard my last name, how many of them seemed to like me so readily and 
quickly and easily and wanted to go out with me and be my steady girlfriend. And I don't mean to make it sound like that's completely terrible, especially when you're young and horny. It's better than getting nothing. But after a while, and it takes a while to realize what's going on around you, especially when it's exciting, I came to realize this wasn't real love. They just loved me for my money. And I realized I could get the same thing more easily and cheaply, say, over in uh, some area where there are prostitutes. And I realized if I was going to find people who loved me and not just money, that I would have to uh, move out to the West Coast. Back then, the Rockefellers weren't so, so well known. I dropped my last name, and I pretend to be just Steve Schlesinger middle-class philosophy teacher, so the women who want to go out with me and love me, love me and not my money because they don't know that I have any money. And this strategy seemed to be working really well when I got here. I met a young lady. We went out for a while. We got along so well. We fell in love. I asked her to marry me. She said yes. We set a date. As it approached, I went to her house to straighten out some of the details. I knocked on the door. Nobody answered. I was puzzled. The door was open. Only the screen door was closed. It seemed like somebody was home. I opened the door to went to go and saw I figured I wasn't going to see anything I wouldn't see in a couple of days anyway. Turned out she was on her phone, deeply engrossed in a conversation with a friend. So deeply engrossed, she didn't hear me knock, didn't know I'd enter. I mean, I didn't mean to eavesdrop, but before I could come around the corner and say, Honey, I'm here, I heard her say to her friend, I found out Steve is a Rockefeller, and when I marry him in a few days, I'm coming into millions of dollars, and you can bet I'm looking forward to that. Well, stunned, you know, she hangs up, I come around the corner, and I tell her, honey, I didn't mean to eavesdrop, I knocked on the door, nobody answered, and before I could come around and tell you I was here, I heard what you just said to your friend, you found out my secret that I'm a Rockefeller, and you know, when you marry me in a couple of days, you're coming into millions of dollars, and you sure are looking forward to that, and what does she say to me, oh, Steve, it isn't your money that I want, it's you that I love. Tell me, future advice columnist, should I marry this girl? Hell no! One of my students once yelled excitedly, and just to tip off my hand here, sometimes people have said, oh, but can't you just love God? It's not that you want to go to heaven, it's just that you love God. Oh, Steve, it isn't the big reward that I want, it's you that I love. Think I would want to marry this girl? Hell no, and I don't. And really, to be as realistic as possible, I hope you'll find that to be one of the hallmarks of my lectures. I try to be as realistic as possible. Realistically, I think it depends on how desperate you are. But as a Rockefeller, there was no reason for me to be that desperate, and so I did not marry her. Now, I do not tell you this story to try to elicit any sympathy from you regarding the personal problems that I have due to the fact that I'm a multimillionaire. I have never gotten any sympathy from anybody for the personal problems that I have due to the fact that I'm a multimillionaire. This is supposed to be in a theological context to get. If it makes any sense that a a rich person would want to hide their identity so the people that love them really love them and not just their money. Theme, by the way, of one of my favorite movies, Coming to America with Eddie Murphy. Of course, he is the prince of a rich African country. He's going to be the king. Every woman in the country wants to marry him so she can be the queen and have status and jewelry. He doesn't want a woman who wants to marry him because she wants status and jewelry. He wants a woman to love him. So he comes to America, goes to Queens in search of his queen. He pretends to be poor. He gets a job working as a janitor in a fast food restaurant. Good luck getting anything under those circumstances, guys, unless you're as cute as any Murphy. But if it makes any sense that a rich person would want to find people and hide their identity to find people who really love them and not their money, they don't want gold diggers, then how much more sense would it make that God or Jesus would hide what they have to offer, what I like to call cosmic bucks, worth much, much more than any amount of earthly money? Oh, we rock Rockefellers, we have millions of dollars, and that sure is nice to have. But let's face it, inflation could eat it up, the IRS could tax it away, a commie revolution would confiscate it. Note from the point of view of the Rockefellers, the IRS, the commies, really the same thing. Just a bunch of other people want to take our money and give it away to somebody else. But if you think you go to heaven, of course, I'm sure God has a good monetary policy. There is no inflation in heaven, and I certainly hope neither IRS agents nor commies will be allowed in heaven there you would be able to take it with you. God wants people who really love their neighbor truly and purely, not expecting some big reward in the end, just like a rich person doesn't want gold diggers. God doesn't want cosmic gold diggers, what one of my former students called them.
And one of my students told me that after hearing this lecture, he went out into the main quad of campus and there was preachers there who were condemning students to hell for being the fornicators that they are. And the student went up to the preacher and said to him, but if you're just doing it to get to heaven, then you're not really doing it because you want to, right? You're not really doing it because you're a good person, right? You're just trying to get a big reward for yourself, aren't you? You're just being selfish, aren't you? He told me the preacher said to him, son, you're thinking about this too much. Yeah, well, he just walked out of my philosophy class. But this is the way I also like to criticize celibates, priests and nuns, Buddhist monks give up sex for the entirety of their lives. I mean, that's unbelievable, isn't it? For most of you, you can't even go 48 hours. They give up sex for the entirety of their lives. But I claim I'm not really very impressed by this. They're just trading earthly orgasms for cosmic orgasms. I mean, if I I say to you, you have a choice, one or the other. If you're really horny, I can arrange for you to have sex right now, and the person that I choose for you will be attractive. I know you don't want somebody who's ugly. There's nothing good about that. They will be attractive, but they're not going to be America's next top model. And maybe after a while, they will begin to smell at least a little bit. But if you just wait until, say, tomorrow, a short period of time, some period of time, you can have anyone you want, rock star, movie star, in combination, anything that you want enthusiastically. Obviously, you'd have to be insane with horniness to not wait. Well, that's what Buddhist monks and priests and nuns see themselves as doing. They're giving up sex with their fellow human beings. And as best I can tell, none of my students really looked ugly to me, although none of them were going to be America's next top model. And they all knew, of course, that after a while they would smell a little bit. But if you just wait to get to heaven and have cosmic orgasms, God is immaculate. God is, of course, the best. And so that's not the spirit of true love. That's just the spirit of a good trade, good investment in your future, spirit of a good trade, spirit of a good investment in your future, not the same as the spirit of true love. And so my first move here has been to separate what in virtually everybody's religious upbringing and virtually every religion they try to put together. I'm trying to show it's an obvious contradiction. This is really nothing more than an examination of the logic of the idea of judgment of moral character, again common to all the religions. When they say they want to judge your moral character, you have to be free to show your true moral character, threaten you with hell or any bad consequence in the afterlife life, then you'll obey. But that's not your true moral character, not your true desires, just what you're forced to do. Promise you heaven or some big reward in the afterlife, then you'll obey. But that's not true love. That's just the desire to collect a big reward, a good investment in your future. Promises of heaven, threats of hell must not come from a God who wants to judge your moral character. And so, to that end, to judge our moral character, God doesn't make it obvious that he's out there watching. You know, look up at the sky. God doesn't make it obvious that he's out there watching. If I would look up and see that there was a God watching me, I would be very intimidated. And so, for that reason, God won't make it obvious that he's watching you. You would obey only because you were scared. God won't do then what I will call a big miracle, which I define as one that all people see, everybody sees it, so there's no doubt that it happened. An image of God appears in the sky all over the world, miles high, beautiful colors, speaks to all the Earth's people, each in their own language, in a voice booming enough to shake the planet just a little bit, so anybody who's sleeping or in the shower comes running out saying, what's going on? Is there an earthquake? No, look up in the sky, an image of God, I've been watching what you people have been doing down there on Earth, and I'm very disgusted with it. I demand you make the following changes if that was accompanied by the killing of the wicked, the resurrection of the virtuous Martin Luther King, Abraham Lincoln, walk the Earth again. Would that prove to me that this was God? I've been trained as a professional philosopher. I'm trained to examine all possible points of view. I realize right away it doesn't necessarily have to be God. 
possibly it's the devil pretending to be God. After all, the devil is a deceiver. So if the devil wants to speak to us, the devil isn't going to say, this is the devil speaking. That would be the truth, not a deception. And the devil is a deceiver. But even more importantly, nobody would listen respectfully and obediently if they thought they were talking to the devil. The supernatural principle of evil wants to lead you astray to the path of eternal damnation, any Christian would run the other way at the first sight of the guy with the horns and the tail. Even a wise guy philosophy professor like me, oh, maybe that's the devil. Maybe I can have a conversation with the devil. That sounds pretty interesting. Generally, all I get to do is have conversations with undergraduate students, and that's great. I mean, a lot of them are very intelligent and very nice people, but a conversation with the devil, that sounds like it'd be fascinating. True, the devil will try to lead me astray down the path to eternal damnation, but I'm a smart philosophy professor. I'll figure out how the devil is trying to lead me astray, make the appropriate correction, stay on the right path, and get to have a conversation with the devil. Maybe that's not the smartest way for me to think. Maybe the devil is even smarter than I am and can lead me astray down the path to eternal damnation, and I don't want to burn in hell forever, so I don't want to have a conversation with the devil. Nobody would listen respectfully and obediently if they thought they were talking to the devil. Nobody wants to go to hell. I mean, imagine, say, that you're a kid and you're up in your room, you know, you're a teenager, you're up in your room reading, and your parents come up to say good night and they knock on your door and they open the door and they say, oh, what are you reading? And you say, oh, I'm reading the devil's book. What are they going to do? They're going to rip it out of your hands, throw it into the fire. They don't want you reading a book by the devil. He's only going to lead you astray down the path to eternal damnation. They don't want you in the path to eternal damnation. That's, of course, why a lot of my students went to a Catholic university. But if your parents knock on the door and open the door and say, oh, what book are you reading? And you say, this is God's book. What are they going to say? Oh, read the whole thing. Memorize every word. So if the devil wants to communicate with us and get us to listen respectfully and obediently, he's not going to say this is the devil speaking. That would be suppressed. The devil's word would be suppressed. He's going to say, this is God speaking. So just because some person or some book, of course, I'm talking about the Bible, the scriptures, just because they say, this is God speaking, this is God's word, doesn't mean it's God speaking, doesn't mean it's God's word, because if the devil wanted to speak, the devil would also say, this is God's word. So just because it says it's God's word, how am I supposed to know? If the devil wants to speak, he's going to say it's God's word. If God wants to speak, he's going to say, I presume it's God's word. How am I supposed to know? One way I've already tried to indicate, to whatever extent it takes away from your true freedom to show your true moral character, all the threats of hell, all the promises of heaven, all the commandments take away from your freedom to show your true desires. These must be from the devil pretending to be God. God needs you to be free. Only that which supports real freedom and supports real love. Those are the words that would come out of God's mouth. And so if an apparition ever appears to you in your life and says, this is God speaking, be careful. Could be the devil pretending to be God and to whatever extent it takes away your freedom would be the devil pretending to be God. Although it doesn't even have to be supernatural. After all, I've taught at college campuses, lots of scientific types, don't believe in God and the supernatural, believe in the theory of evolution. There are no supernatural creatures. There are only natural creatures, animals. Of course, as far as we know, humans the most advanced animal on this planet. I can give an explanation for this occurrence, the so-called big miracle, the appearance of the image of God in the sky all over the world by giving an explanation that would be congenial to the worldview of an evolutionist who doesn't believe in the supernatural. They might claim it's just some very powerful creature, scientists from communist China, aliens from outer space, anyone who has mastered nature's forces and processes to such an extent they can perform to my relatively primitive eyes, technologically primitive eyes, what seems to be a miracle doesn't have to be a miracle, could just be some technological superior Priority. Say, for the example, of uh, the Aztecs, when the conquistadors appeared, the Aztecs thought the conquistadors were gods. They had these huge fighting Spanish war horses. They had firearms, relatively primitive guns, nothing accurate a distance, made a hell of a noise. Imagine, say, you're a group of thousand Aztec warriors. You come up to a half a dozen Spanish conquistadors. All of a sudden, one of them raises a stick, points it at your group. There's a clap of thunder. He pulls the trigger, the gunpowder goes off, a flash of lightning comes out of the muzzle, all of a sudden blood spurts out of your friend's chest, he lays 
Jake falls down dead. These are the gods. They've got thunder and lightning machines. They're killing us. Wasn't gods. Wasn't thunder and lightning machines. Just a technology they were unfamiliar with. In the Glade Classic series, the Left Behind series by the Reverend LaHaye has sold tens of millions of copies. It's the story of the rapture. God takes his chosen ones to heaven, and there's lots and lots of them, not just a relative few. People just vanish. Some of you just vanish. Your clothes are here. Your books are here. You're gone. Airplanes in the sky. God loves the pilot. He gets taken to heaven. God loves the co-pilot. He gets taken to heaven. Some of the Passengers just disappear. They're on a plane in the sky. Where did everybody go? The people are panicking because nobody's flying the plane. It's going to crash and they're going to die. They don't realize the fact that they're still on earth and not in heaven means they're going to burn in hell for all of eternity and that's going to be a much bigger problem. People start trying to figure out what might be going on around them. Some of them come up with the theory that aliens have attacked the planet and are spiriting lots of people away using something like the transporter beam from the Star Trek series, and so even the Reverend LaHaye realizes, even if the rapture came and millions of people disappeared, it wouldn't have to be God. It could be aliens pretending to be God, or really, my favorite example from The Wizard of Oz at the end, when Dorothy walks in, this is the great and powerful Oz, looks godly to her, looks supernatural to her, nothing of the kind, just a guy with a technology she's unfamiliar with, sound system and projector, gets they didn't have them in Kansas when she was a kid. And so, just like in The Wizard of Oz, this is the great and powerful Oz, my image in the sky, this is the great and powerful God. Doesn't have to be God, could be aliens or scientists from communist China. Anyone who has developed a sound system bigger than the one the Wizard of Oz had, projector bigger than the one the Wizard of Oz had, project the image of God all over the sky, project the image of God, all, the word of God all over the world, turn up the bass, make the planet tremble just a little bit. And so I like to call this the radical critique. Nothing can ever prove the existence of God would just prove some powerful creature. And I call it radical because everybody's seen it. There's no doubt that it happened. Unlike the small miracles from the religions I'll be getting to in a few minutes where relatively few people saw the miracle, usually long ago and far away, and you're supposed to believe that it happened. Obviously, there's room for skepticism here. But with the big miracle, there's no room for skepticism. Everybody's seen it. There's no doubt that it happened. And it's totally awesome. I mean, Moses parting the Red Sea would be pretty awesome. But an image in God in the sky all over over the world still doesn't prove the existence of God or the supernatural could just be some powerful creature pretending to be God. Nothing proves the existence of God. But the most important point here, it would prove the existence of some powerful creature. I might not know who has the power. Is it God? Although that doesn't seem likely because it would take away my freedom. Although maybe God has decided he doesn't want me to have freedom anymore. How am I supposed to know? Is it the devil pretending to be God? So we'll be more likely to do what the devil wants us to do? Do? Is it aliens pretending to be gods who will be more likely to accept their presence on Earth? I don't know who has the power, but I've seen that somebody does. You don't have to know who has the power, just that somebody does. If you're walking around late at night by yourself, not good advice, don't try this, and somebody jumps out of a bush and they have a mask on, so you don't know who it is, but they put a big gun right in your face, give you an order, lay down on the ground and so forth. You don't have to know who's behind the mask, but somebody's there. They have a lot of power. They have a big gun. You'd have to do what you were told. Under those circumstances, you wouldn't be free. We couldn't judge you. So the same thing with my big miracle. I don't know who has the power, God, devil, aliens, but somebody does. I've seen it. That would intimidate me. I'd have to do whatever they told me. I would have lost my freedom. God couldn't judge me. That's why God doesn't make it obvious that he's out there watching. And so, the only miracles that God might do, if any, and maybe, they're all just a bunch of stories, but the small miracles from the religions in front of a few, a few, a few dozen, few hundred, few thousand, few million for the milk miracle I will be discussing. God knows fully well when those few who saw the miracle go and try and spread the word and tell other people, you can try this yourself. Go tell your friends they've seen a, that you've seen a miracle. Generally, they will ask you if you are crazy or if 
you are on drugs at the colleges. They ask if you will get them some of the drugs. They would like to see miracles also. One of my students started calling these miracle drugs. Man, get me some of these miracles. I'd like to see miracles too. The usual response that people have to miracles and miracle stories, disbelief, if not outright laughter, especially when they hear miracle stories from other places and different cultures. So when people come up to me and say stuff like, and I hear stuff like this all the time, Steve, I'm Jewish. Steve, I'm Christian, Steve, I'm Muslim, Steve, I'm Mormon, Steve, I'm Buddhist, Steve, I'm Hindu. That usually does not mean, Steve, I have taken every course in religious studies this campus offers. I have studied intensively and objectively the miracle claims of all the major world's religions, and on intensive and objective analysis, I've reached the conclusion that the miracle claims of all the major world's religions, they're all a bunch of bullshit, except the miracle claims of this one major world's religion. Religion. On intensive and objective analysis, I've reached the conclusion those miracles really did happen, and just by happy coincidence for me, that's the religion that my parents taught me in my childhood during my upbringing. Usually tells you much more about their childhood and their religious upbringing than it does about any intensive and objective analysis of the evidence. So when somebody says to me, Steve, I'm Jewish, that means Moses was their homeboy. They believe in the miracles of the Old Testament, but they don't believe in the New Testament. Christians, of course, Jesus was your homeboy. You believe in the miracles of the Old Testament. Jesus, of course, the fulfillment of the prophecy of the Messiah from the Old Testament. But you also believe in the miracles of the New Testament. And I'll say, since I was born and raised Jewish, my mother said to me, Steve, one day you're going to leave my Jewish household. You're going to go out into the world. You're going to meet people called Christians. They're going to try to tell you there was this guy named Jesus Christ, who is the fulfillment of the prophecy from our Old Testament of the Messiah, and that he wrote a book called the New Testament that replaces our Old Testament. They'll tell you, put away the Old Testament, embrace the New Testament, leave Judaism, convert to Christianity. Steve, when they tell you that, my mom used to say, don't believe them. It's a bunch of bullshit. It never happened. Jews don't believe in Christianity. Jews and Christians don't believe in the Muslim religion. You know the chronology here, 700 years years, roughly after Jesus, Mohammed comes along, claims to be inspired by an angel, leave behind a newer testament in the same tradition, the same vein. They believe in the Old Testament. They consider themselves sons of Abraham. Muslims believe that Jesus was a great prophet of God and that the New Testament is the word of God. They don't believe that he was the Messiah, for the same reason, by the way, that the Jews don't believe that he was the Messiah. It says in the prophecy of the Messiah in the Old Testament, when the Messiah comes, there will be world peace. You've noticed there has never been world peace. Simple logic, the Messiah never came. Sometimes, by the way, Christians say, oh yes, he was the Messiah, but we rejected him in our hearts and he has to come again the second coming. Jews will point out, uh, it doesn't say unless we reject him in our hearts and then he's going to have to come again. It just says when he comes there will be world peace. But he was a great prophet. The New Testament is the word of God, but Muslims also believe that Muhammad left behind a newer testament they call the Quran. I wish they had preserved the symmetry and just called it the newer testament, the old, the new, the newer. And of course, Jews and Christians don't believe that. They think it's a bunch of bullshit. Muslims, when they hear you say that, of course, want to chop off your head. And then the Mormon religion, and again, they're in Judeo-Christian tradition. This is my book of Mormon. Note, of course, it's called Another Testament of Jesus Christ, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And if you say to a Mormon, what do you have to do to be saved? They'll tell you you have to have faith in Jesus, same as the Christians, except they don't mean faith in the second, in the New Testament. They mean faith in the Book of Mormon. And what Mormons believe, and I couldn't do better, by the way, than to advise you to see the Great South Park episode, all about Mormons. I had students tell me I wasn't allowed to watch South Park and of course, by the way, inspired of course the great play, The Book of Mormon. Very expensive to get tickets, but what Mormons believe, oh, and I want to mention I found this, by the way, I was taking a hiking vacation in Zion Park in Utah. It snowed. It was Easter and it snowed. I was snowed into my cabin. I couldn't get out. I didn't bring anything to read. I was planning on hiking. I looked around. There was a copy of the New Testament in the motel, of course. I've read that before, but I'd never read The Book of Mormon. So I had something to read. 
I started, I got about this far, I started to laugh, and I didn't get any farther. What Mormons believe, after Jesus was crucified 2,000 years ago, he didn't go to heaven to be with his father for all of eternity. Maybe he went to party for a while. He had other fish to fry. He appeared here in the New World, preached to the Indians, left behind a record of his preaching inscribed on golden plates, becomes the Book of Mormon, left it to one of the Indian prophet historians, a guy named Moroni. This was A.D. 421, uh, the in or about the year A.D. 421, Moroni, last of the Nephite prophet historians, sealed the sacred record. Jesus preached to him, sealed the sacred record, hid it up unto the Lord, hid it on a mountainside, to be brought forth in the latter days, as predicted by the voice of God through the ancient prophets. In 1823, this same Moroni, now a resurrected person, visits the prophet Joseph Smith and delivers the engraved plates to him. Him. And so A.D. 421, Jesus preaches to the Indians in the New World, leaves a record of his teaching inscribed on golden plates, gives it to an Indian named Moroni. Moroni buries it under a rock on a mountain in upstate New York. Then, 1823, 1400 years later, the white man in the New World, Joseph Smith in upstate New York, Moroni appears to him, says, hey, Joe, up on that mountain under that rock, I buried another testament of Jesus Christ. Go have a look. Joseph Smith goes, has a look, finds the golden plates, translates them into the Book of Mormon, another testament of Jesus Christ, beats a lot of skepticism, of course. The Mormons are driven off the East Coast. Joseph Smith himself is assassinated, I believe, in Illinois, leaves the Book of Mormon to one of his disciples. The guy was named Brigham Young. They take it out to Utah, where it's supposed to be buried under the main Mormon temple in Salt Lake City. And the Mormons refused to dig it up to let scholars examine it for authenticity or even to show that it exists. But I always like to point out the guy who's the central figure gets the testament from Jesus Christ, buries it, then 1400 years later, now in a resurrected person, gives it to Joseph Smith. The prophet is named Moroni. M-O-R-O-N-I. Moroni looks like moron with an I at the end. And often, of course, you make a plural simply by adding an I. Radius radii, stadium stadii, syllabus syllabi, these are the moroni. Easy to make this blatantly moronic. Now, I'm not sure whose sense of humor this is, although if I ever find out, I would like to thank them. I think it's one of the funniest things in all of human history, have the ultimate scripture delivered by a guy whose name looks like moron. I mean, this is my sense of humor. I would have put it in the book if I could, but I wasn't around back in 1823, unless you think I'm a resurrected person. So it's either got to be God's sense of humor or Joseph Smith's sense of humor. What do you think? Is it God's sense of humor to give us the ultimate scripture from a prophet whose name looks like moron? Or is it Joseph Smith's sense of humor? Anybody who thinks this is really the word of God and you don't realize I'm having one over on you, you must be a moron? I'm not sure whose sense of humor this is, but if I ever meet him, I sure want to thank him. I think it's one of the funniest things in all of human history. Although, since some of the nicest people and best students I have ever had were Mormon. I will say, with God, all things are possible. If you believe in one resurrection, why not believe in another resurrection? And when I married this woman from Thailand, one of these Buddhist countries, almost nobody has heard of Jesus. She came over here. She asked me about Christianity. I started to explain how Christianity revolves around an immaculate conception and a virgin birth. She didn't miss a beat. She told me in a village in northern Thailand, God came down and impregnated 180 virgins. They had 180 immaculate conceptions, 180 virgin births. That's a very Thai Buddhist way of doing things, by the way. They're very religiously tolerant. It isn't, oh, your miracles are bullshit. Ours are the only ones that are real. It's, hey, they're all good, but you only had one immaculate conception. God gave Thailand 180 immaculate conceptions. God loved Thailand 180 times more than he loves you. And to cover all the religions as best I can, the Hindu milk miracle. 
Not sure if you've heard of this, you can Google this, MilkMiracle.com, the best documented paranormal phenomenon of modern times. Watch the video, six minutes, five seconds. This was in 1995. I, as I recall, a guy was having a dream that the statue of Lord Ganesha, the stone statue of the elephant in the corner of Apu's convenience store in every Simpsons episode, that the statue was thirsty, so he goes to a nearby Hindu temple, gets the priest to open the gates, goes up to the stone statue of Lord Ganesha, offers it some milk. The statue drank the milk. The milk disappeared. They were amazed. Word spread. Temples all over India. Millions of people flocked to the temples to give the stone statue of the god Lord Ganesha milk. It drank the milk. Uh, never before in history has a simultaneous miracle occurred on a global scale. Television stations, CNN, BBC, Washington Post, New York Times eagerly covered this unique phenomena. Even skeptical journalists held their milk-filled spoons to the statue of the gods and watched as the milk disappeared. What followed is unprecedented in modern Hindu history. Word spread like a brush fire. The stock market in India shut down. The government in India shut down. Not just in India, in the Hindu temples in London. I had a piece. I remember one of the Hindus says, holy cow, this can't be happening. That's what the Hindu says. Holy cow, this can't be happening. Did they rig all the temples in the world or what? I mean, if it was just one statue, you would think some mischievous person came in in the middle of the night, you know, drilled a hole, inserted a straw vacuum pump, but this was every statue in every temple all over the world. I had one student, by the way, tell me, oh yeah, my father saw that. I'll be curious to see after hearing this how many of you go out and convert to being a Hindu. And so Jews don't believe in Jesus, Jews and Christians don't believe in Muhammad, Jews, Christians, and Muslims. The Mormon religion looks pretty moronic. Buddhists have 180 immaculate conceptions, Hindu statues drink milk, plug in the miracle stories of your favorite local cult. I have a favorite local cult, the Self-Realization Fellowship up on Highway 101 in Encinitas. This is a picture of their founder, Yogananda, right? It's called the Self-Realization Fellowship right near Swami Beach, by the way, famous surf spot. That's why it's called Swami Beach, because of the nearby proximity of the Self-Realization Fellowship. I believe they were going to have a surf tournament at Swami Beach some years ago and the Self-Realization Fellowship complained the noise of the surf tournament would disturb the tranquility of their meditation gardens. The surf tournament was cancelled. I think they have a lot of political influence and I remember one story that I read about Yogananda where he showed up at a funeral in Del Mar. He was a little bit late but he walked up to the dead woman's body and put his hand on her forehead, invoked the divine power, and within 30 seconds she came back to life. He resurrected the dead. And so I'll be curious, after hearing this lecture, how many of you will run up to the Self-Realization Fellowship in Del Mar? After all, think about what a hit you'll be at the next funeral you go to if you can learn to resurrect the dead. And I like to point out, this is his picture. I ask, uh, who does he look a little bit like? He looks a little bit like Jesus as one of my students mentioned, Jesus with a Hindu twist. And of course, so many other miracles. Here's uh, the famous tortilla miracle in Lake Arthur, New Mexico. Maria Rubio saw the face of Jesus in one of her tortillas. The tortilla miracle we've had, I think now pieces of toast have been sold on eBay for lots of money. This one that I got uh, from Newsweek, June 23rd, 1997. God made me buy that tomato. British 14-year-old Chaiste de Javed, who claims that the flesh of a sliced tomato spelled out, there is only one God, and Mohammed is the messenger, in Arabic. And, of course, it's in Arabic, so we can't understand if that's what it really says. Now, I don't know these things didn't happen. Why well, I want to explain this in terms of doubt. 
I don't know they didn't happen. It's possible that they happened. I wasn't with Moses to see, oh, he never parted the Red Sea. For some reason, his followers made this up. I wasn't with Jesus to see, oh, he never was resurrected. For some reason, his followers made this up. I wasn't with Mohammed to see, oh, he was never inspired by an angel. For some reason, his followers made this up. I wasn't with Joseph Smith, an angel named Moroni. Give me a break, Joe. How stupid do you think I am? I wasn't in the village in northern Thailand. I wasn't in the Hindu temple. I don't know these things didn't happen. It's possible that they happened. But generally speaking, I don't believe that they happened. I'm in doubt, and that's when you're free, when you don't know that God exists and is watching. Morality is not what you do when you know you are being watched. When you know you are being watched, of course you are good. Morality is what you do when you don't know that you're being watched. Keeping in mind you can't know that they're not watching you. They could always be hiding. And so, just like when we drive on the freeway, if there is a policeman right behind you, I'm coming out the freeway, everyone's speeding past me at incredible speeds, all of a sudden, on a nearby freeway, coming up the Cloverleaf is a couple of motorcycle policemen. Immediately, everybody slows down. Does that show sudden conversion to respect for the speed limit laws of the freeways of California? Of course it doesn't. They're just afraid of getting stopped, getting a punishment, a ticket, points off their license, increasing their insurance their parents will be mad at them. If you know you're being watched, of course you're good. Nobody speeds in front of a policeman. When do you speed? When you don't see a policeman. And just because you don't see a policeman doesn't mean they're is no policeman. They could always be hiding back in traffic, be hiding in some sophisticated way. And so this is my criticism of atheists who think that they know there is no God. How can you know there is no God? That's like saying no police are watching me. They could be hiding in some sophisticated way. God could be hiding in some sophisticated way. God could be hiding behind the starry heavens above. I'm sure if there is a God, God has figured out how to hide from me. And now you can say, See why God would need to hide only when you don't know that you're being watched. Are you free to show your true self? Can I get away with it or not? Again, you can't be sure you're going to get away with something. You might always be caught later and then be punished. But if you don't know you're going to be caught and punished, then you're free. We see what you really like. If you do the bad thing, obviously that's no good. And if you don't do the bad thing, and not so much out of fear, Oh, they might be watching. I might get caught. I might be punished. I better not do that. That's me driving, by the way. I only obey because I don't want a ticket. But, you know, the more usual, as best I can tell, the coast is clear. As best I can tell, I could get away with this. But no, I wouldn't do it anyway. I'm not that type of person. That, of course, is real morality, although really the speeding example seems too trivial. So to give a more serious example, I'll set the situation in eastern Congo, the Rwanda situation. You're familiar with the movie. Millions of civilians have been killed. Government is completely broken down. No authority. Soldiers, police for a thousand miles. Gangs of armed thugs roaming the countryside, killing, terrorizing civilians, stealing the resources. Maybe I'm with one of these gangs of armed thugs and we see a civilian village in the distance. Oh, let's go and kill the men and have lots of fun with the women. And I suppose it's possible that the United Nations will raise up a force and come in and catch us and we'll be brought to justice, but they haven't even started raising a force. It's a long way to get here. And when we're done raping these people, we're going to murder them and burn their corpses anyway, so there won't be anybody left to testify against us. But no, even if I could get away with it, I wouldn't do that to people. I'm not that type of persist. I'm not a rapist. That, of course, real morality. And so when you feel doubt in your heart about the truth of religion or the existence of God. That is not what they have taught you up until today. Some irreligious falling away. Go tell your parents or your grandparents, oh, after hearing my philosophy lectures, I'm full of doubt, Grandma. Maybe there haven't been any miracles. Maybe they're all just a bunch of stories. Even if there had been miracles, it could have been aliens pretending to be God, Grandma. Maybe there is no Grandma. Maybe evolution is true. Maybe you're just animals. 
How will they respond? Oh, you learn something clever? They will get angry at you for reasons I will be explaining and accuse you of having a falling away, an irreligious falling away from God. Now I have tried to show you really the opposite is true. It's only when you doubt that God exists, only when you doubt that you're being watched, that's when you're free to show your true moral character. That's when God can judge you. That's what God wants, an essential part of God's plan for you. And since God needs you to doubt his existence, really, deep down inside, I try to argue, everybody does doubt God's existence, although, of course, not everyone will admit it, as you know. But don't just listen to what people say. Talk is cheap. People can be confused about what they really think and how they really feel. Watch what people do. Actions speak louder than words. So I note that people sin. But nobody sins in front of their father. You don't know any guy, no matter how lusty, tries to get it on with his girlfriend if her father is in the room watching them. And what's the difference between doing it in front of her earthly father and doing it in front of her heavenly father? Much worse to do it in front of her heavenly father. I've had students who were big and strong enough that they could probably beat up her father. I had students who looked like they could run fast enough to get some of what they wanted from his daughter and then run away from the father and escape the beating the father would like to give him. But you can't beat up God. You can't run away from God. He's going to know what you did with your girlfriend, ladies. He's going to he's going to know what you let your boyfriend do with your body. You're going to be caught. You're going to be punished. You're going to be burned all over your body for all of eternity. When we sin shows that we don't really believe the Father is there. If we think the Father is there, we don't sin. And when I was young, by the way, I sinned as much as I could. I loved to sin, but I never sinned in front of my father. That would have been really stupid. And as intimidating as my father was, he never even had to hit me, by the way. Just give me an intimidating look. God, of course, a lot more intimidating. Burn me all over my body, even on my genitals, for all of eternity. And sometimes, you know, people have tried to say to me, Oh, Steve, we sin because we're imperfect. No, no, no. This goes way beyond imperfect to unbelievable stupidity. Imperfect is taking your object of love, lust, desire to some dark lover's lane where you assume that you're alone. You can never be sure that you're alone if your mother was like mine. Possible she installed hidden microphones and cameras in your car, bugged some of the trails in the mountains, but she probably can't bug all the trails in the mountains. So you take your loved one to some dark lover's lane where you assume that you're alone. You sin there. Maybe you want to call that imperfect, but doing in front of your father is not imperfect. That's stupid. Nobody is that stupid. When we sin, shows we don't believe the father is there. If your father is there, you don't sin. And people are afraid of dying. Even your supposedly religious older relatives who so to say that they believe in God, they're afraid of dying. They're terrified of dying. They don't believe in an afterlife, even if they're in terrible pain here on earth, they don't want to die, go on to a better place. Obviously, they don't believe that there's a better place, otherwise they would want to die and get there as soon as they can, especially before finals. Also, people have objected to me, oh no, Steve, just because you're threatened with going to hell doesn't mean you're not free, you still have a choice. Do you want to go to hell or not? And it kind of sounds like it's a choice, but it's not really a choice because you have to do something. After all, I remember I once said to a student, if a motorcycle policeman was on your tail, you would never speed. Even if you were driving up Interstate 5 from San Diego to Sacramento, if he was right on your tail, you would never speed. And he didn't like the logic there, so he said, no, 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 I think eventually you'd speed. Obviously, he lost his license long ago, and if you're free under these circumstances, then I have no idea the meaning of the word slave. What is it that makes a slave a slave? Except that somebody, their master, can threaten them with some great punishment, usually culminating in death. And of course, being threatened with burning in hell for all of eternity is even worse than being threatened with death. And slaves, of course, are not free. That's what makes them slaves. Otherwise, how could Lincoln have freed the slaves? He couldn't. They were free all Already. They had a choice. No, they didn't. They were slaves. They had no choice. Slaves aren't free. Otherwise, Lincoln couldn't have freed the slaves. Mm -hmm.